if you are going to spend money in a rotten environment, what do you think is going to happen? I think we're probably maybe going to have to agree that a reset button of sorts is going to have to be hit. Because you're taking this money, you're taking 254 billion rands of ESCOM's debt, and you're saying, I'm giving you a chance to start all over again. But, hello, I mean, you, 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 you're expecting the very same people that are responsible for this mess and for this disaster. You know, we've been speaking about the professionalization of the public service for quite some time. And it's lip service. We spent a lot of money as BLSA last year, two and a half million rands, I think, in putting together a framework within which South Africa needs to professionalize it. Just to say, we know we need, but how do we actually go about doing it? Because I agree, the genesis of our problems is that we don't have a capable state. The genesis of our problems is that at some point, this government decided to be anti-intellectuals. The genesis of our problems is that as we seek to try and fix things, and as we spend all this money, and as we're saying we're implementing reforms and whatever the case is, those who are meant to implement all of this are not the cream de la creme of this country. And it, 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 I struggle to reconcile it in my mind because I say, I would have thought that putting your best foot forward means you take the best that the country has to offer. We had this discussion with the president, I think it must have been sometime last year, as business, and we said, you know, Mr. President, our problem as business is that you insist on giving us the worst of the worst. You see, if you made an effort of putting in place CFOs who know the difference between income and cash, then maybe we would leave you alone. Because it's not like we don't have skills in this country. It's not like we don't have, we've got a minister of electricity coming. I don't even know what makes us think we need yet another minister when we're sitting in a mess with just these two ministries. And you must look at it. What a joke that appointment is actually going to be. What do you expect that person to do in this rotten environment? So I think I'm just saying that the problem that we have as business at the moment, it's all good and well. We can put all these grand plans in place. We can spend all these trillions of rents. But unless and until we fix the environment within which we're operating, as unless and until we press a reset button, on those that are charged with the government and with the delivery and with the implementation, it's just another budget. We're gonna come here next year and we're gonna talk about nothing. Because this is this is this is really but yeah, so we had a budget yesterday. It was a brilliant budget, it was a solid budget, it was a sensible budget. And um I think the minister, really, in terms of trying to address the country's critical problems, while in it and obtain fiscal discipline. And I think we have to give it to him that he has committed to fiscal consolidation, which is what we as business was worried about or were worried about when you actually came to the party to say, is he going to actually hold the line, you know, the same way that Dito did? And I think to our surprise, he has done a fairly decent job in terms of, 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 of trying to do that. Now, ESCOM was obviously a big one. We expected that ESCOM was actually going to come. And uh, the debt relief of $254 billion is definitely bigger than what we expected as, as, as business. We, 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 we knew it was going to be a handsome, a handsome number. When we started at the ESCOM board in 2018, the number that we gave to... Um, to 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 Tito at the time was 150 billion. You know to say that take 150 billion, you know, and allow us the space and allow us to actually uh, 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 have some balance sheet strength to can be able to uh, uh, um, um, 
uh, take on some debt, fix the power stations, and, and whatever the case is. And uh, they said no. Uh, it's interesting. We taking the 254 billion uh, rents debt from 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 ESCOM. We have given them conditionalities, and I think that is important because I think the market was waiting to see, and they were watching closely to see if this debt relief is actually going to come with some kind of conditionalities. It has come with conditionalities. The first one is that they need to prioritize capital expenditure in transmission and distribution. Prioritize capital expenditure in transmission and distribution. SCAM at the moment is sitting with about... Now, the supply chain of ESCOM is rotting. From, 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 from the person... From the people who write out the RFP, it is written for specific companies. ESCOM sits with more than 450 companies that are bogus companies. Bogus in the sense that they've been put there so that when an RFP comes out, it is caught by these companies. ESCOM wrote, I think Andrew spoke about we wrote off 20 billion rands worth of, of assets and stock, stock in particular, um, that, and I don't know what, what explanation he gave to the write-off in the public domain, I don't remember, but we wrote off that 20 billion rands worth of stock because it was never there in the first place. Because... ESCOM sits with a problem of a procurement process is started and finished and no stock, no diesel, no coal is ever delivered. So we are giving them this relief so that they can spend capital expenditure in inverted commas on transmission and distribution. Let's see if that capital expenditure actually comes through. And they're supposed to focus on the maintenance of generation fleet and improve it. Availability. You know, back then, we said to be able to focus on the maintenance of generation. You know, when you have, we're currently sitting at stage six load shedding. Back then, stage six load shedding obviously was not as prevalent as it is at the moment. Just stage four, stage three, you are called by a minister to say a meeting, what time is it? intervention on operations is totally unacceptable, but you're called by the minister and he says, what are you going to do? We're on stage four. What am I supposed to call the, to tell the president? I'm getting his calls. Every 30 minutes he wants to know what you're actually going to do. And you say, but minister, actually the problem, so what is the problem? Problem, boiler troop leaks, whatever the case is, and okay, so what are you going to do? And no, Minister, we want to take this unit out so that we can... So while you take this unit out, what is going to happen? Uh, I think we're going to have to stay in stage three, low trading according to the suppliers. It's, it's going to three, four days, whatever the case is. It says, you're going to have to understand the context within which you're operating. You're going to have to understand that some of the decisions that you make as the board are not politically palatable. You're going to have to understand that there's municipal elections around the corner. So taking a unit out and keeping the country on stage three, stage four for four days, unfortunately, is not going to fly. So you're going to have to buy diesel at whatever price you can get it, and you run OCGTs. And we have raised this issue that, you know, the way we are running the open gas cycle turbines is dangerous. Very soon... These things are going to give up. They are not meant to be a permanent intervention. They are meant to be a stop at exercise. So we see it in an environment where we are likely to get to a stage eight, stage nine, whatever that is going to look like, because we're not even going to have OCGTs to run. But never mind OCGTs. You look at the fact that the billions of rands, we, we, we shouldn't have generating generation fleet that was struggling to find money for maintenance. Because when you look at the billions that we actually spend 
on diesel, which we don't get back from NASA, you look at what is that opportunity cost. You know, Paramani had the back then once said, spending money on diesel is tantamount to flushing money down the toilet. Because you, there isn't any return that you can actually point to. You know, and it's, it's, it's a tricky one because then there is a billion rands of, you know, that is lost to the economy with every stage six of load trading or whatever the case is. But then do, do you continue flushing money down the toilet? Or do you say, let's fast bait and do the right thing so that we know that in six months or whatever the case is, we can have generation fleet that is equal to a task. But anyway, I'm digressing. So we're supposed to be focusing on the maintenance of generation fleet as the second conditionality. We really think that this is a highly positive move towards the much needed energy generation and, and, and security. But honestly, the ESCOM case, I think, is a very problematic one for me. It is a problematic one because it is such a problem we have decided to declare a state of disaster. So where this money lands, actually, NICOM has come to business and they've said we need 100 million rands for us to be able to implement the electricity crisis plan. Business has made the 100 million rands available. 25 million of that 100 million comes from BNSA. So I think we're going to have to question these things to say, okay, so we're giving you 100 million. What are you going to do differently? Because part of that electricity crisis plan says fix as cop. What does fix in this? Fixing ESCOM is not buying more stock. That is not going to come. It's not, right? It is, the foundation is rotten. And I asked this to the president when he actually spoke to us as business before he, before he went out to the country to talk about the electricity crisis plan. And I said, president, it's interesting. You've got fixed ESCOM. What does that mean? What does that mean when we know that ESCOM continues to be the ground zero for siphoning funds out of the state? Because if it means pouring more money into ESCOM, then we're wasting our time. And I don't even know or remember what his answer was, but he really didn't have an answer. But we're taking 24 billion rands from ESCOM's balance sheet so that we can fix ESCOM. I think the issue of, of, of municipal debt is an, is an interesting one. This is another one where we're actually told that it's not politically palatable to just shut down municipalities. Municipalities are not paying and so where to and whatever the case is, you can't just switch off their lights. You know, there are political implications to that. So it's basically saying that, you know what, just shut up and sit down. It's above your pay grade. You know, let the politicians deal with it. So it's interesting, you see, we have inculcated this culture of not paying, of not. So these people in some other areas don't even want the prepaid meters. Eh? So they are saying we're going to take the municipal debt or we're going to give them debt relief on the condition that they install prepaid municipalities. I'd like to see how that is going to happen. Because when they go to Soweto, when they go to Tembisa, when they, they are not being allowed to install prepaid municipalities. We have a culture of entitlement in this country. We have gotten people to be used to the fact that you are going to get everything for free. That is the ticket on which this government came into power. Free electricity, free education, free house, free health, free whatever. Now, 30 years later, you want to make us pay for this thing? What's wrong with you? You know? And there's 2024 around the corner. So are they really going to con continue to implement that when there's the elections that are actually hanging on the balance? It, 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 it would be interesting, but I guess... Just from a principal perspective, it would be interesting. It's the right thing to do. I don't think that these debt reliefs should come without conditions. So I think it's great that they're going to install prepaid meters. But honestly, I think in a nutshell, I'm saying I'm not believing what we are being sold. But this is what we have to work with. And as business, we've got a responsibility to say in the current environment as as tough as it is, how do we actually make it work? And how do we actually work with the same government to ensure that we can actually deliver on these things? And don't get me wrong, there are elements of government who actually want to do the right thing. It's just that there are just way too many crooks and they far outnumber the few good men and women who want to do the right thing.
but we will continue working with a few good men and men and women who want to do the right thing. So there was the energy fiscal support, and we highly welcome that from a business perspective. We think that it was a great move. And I, I think I'm going to leave the tax specialist to probably maybe talk about the tax relief uh, package. But I think it was interesting for me in terms of how they've conceptualized it. They are saying that you, we are going to give you relief from a taxable, or you can claim these things back from a taxable income perspective, and you can have rebates and other cases in the next two years. Next two years makes sense, because remember, we're trying to stimulate economic growth. We're trying to get as much investment into the country as possible. So you do want to give them a window period. We've got the fifth investment conference that is coming up now. Is it in April or is it in May? Where the president at the SONA last week said, uh, now, this time around, I'm trying to raise two trillion rand. And I said, <laughs> in which environment? How, how, you know, what, how do you actually get that right? How do you actually get that right? Because honestly, let, our business case for investment is very difficult. You know, when you speak to CEOs, and I think it's 60% of the JSC listed companies, 60% of the JSC stand corrected, don't quote me on that number, is actually foreign owned, which means that those CEOs can make investment decisions in South Africa. They actually have to go to their, BMW has to go to Germany to say how much can I invest. Total has to go to France. Nestle has to go to Switzerland and so forth and so forth. So when they sit for investment allocation purposes, Nestle sits with China, with US, with Europe, with CEOs, and they all have to present a business case on why the large part of the investment allocation has to come to South Africa. Now, what is the business case that South African CEOs put in front of their principals, wherever their principals are, to try and invest in this country? When the network industries, and the minister paid enough and sufficient attention to network industries yesterday, that was brilliant. When the network industries, at the very least, I'm not going to name all of our other problems, network industries, at the very least, are not functioning as they should. You see, investment will happen, and business will invest. But it's going to be triggered by two, and two things only. We need policy reform, and we need a functioning state. And a functioning state is seen in the network. In the, we have four network industries. Three out of the four are dysfunctional. Energy, telecoms, and ports, and water, dysfunctional. Telecoms is the only one that is functional. It is functional because at some point, someone had the sense to privatize it. It is the now telecom. So it doesn't matter which environment you operate in or which sector of business you sit in. You need, at the very least, the condition precedent. When you say, I'm going to invest in this country, the condition precedent is that the environment has to work. And the environment working means you have to have electricity means you can transport your goods and services, you know, ports, and those who deal in exports and imports in this country have to bypass the Devon ports and go to Maputo. And your consignment lands there, and you actually have to use the road, because the rail is dysfunctional, it doesn't exist, have to use the road to bring it to South Africa. And you'll be lucky if your track is not going to be hijacked somewhere between Maputo and South Africa. And there's portals and what are the cases and all of that. And water is the next crisis that we're actually going to face. So investment will come. But the condition precedent is that the system at the very least, the network industry, have to work. So the focus of business right now in terms of working with government is how do we get the network industry at the very least. Never mind these grand plans and these hundred things that they are trying to focus on, which they never deliver on. By the way, can we just focus on these two things? Network industries, network industries, and crime and corruption. Lawlessness is becoming a problem in this country. South Africa is quickly becoming a mafia state. We might have been an apartheid state before 1994. Now we have transitioned from being an apartheid state to being a mafia state. That is what we are known for. It cannot be right. I don't know how many of you saw the GTOC report that was released last year talking about in relation to the rest of the world, where is South Africa sitting? And we're not sitting in a good place. So business has said network industries and crime and corruption is where we're actually going to work with you on. 
So um, we are going to make sure that we invest uh, 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 on that. So the energy fiscal support package, very welcome, brilliant move. We're hoping that business will invest the way it needs to invest. And uh, I really thought that the bounce back loan guarantee scheme to incentivize renewable energy uh, investment for SMEs was also a brilliant move. The only thing we're talking to the minister about is that how are you going to make sure that this time around it is accessible? Because when you remember during COVID, they announced a similar bounce back loan scheme. But when you spoke to a lot of SMEs, they told you that, but we can't access this thing. You know, how do you actually ensure, never mind being accessible? We're going to have to make sure that whatever funds that are being put towards bringing relief to businesses, to South African consumers, and whatever cases, go towards their intended purpose. Because I think there is that risk as well to say how much of this is actually going to go towards its purpose. But I really think overall the minister from an energy crisis perspective has done a brilliant job, you know, so he articulates the vision and where it lands from an implementation perspective, obviously, is removed from there. So I really think that, therefore, from a business perspective, our goal is to say, we know you've got this grand plan to implement. How do we ensure that we actually make it happen? How do we help you from a resources perspective, from a capacity perspective, from an implementation perspective, from a how, what does that look like from where you're sitting? And those are the conversations that we're actually having with, um, with government. I was very disappointed about the SAA bailout. In this current environment, I don't know if SAA is priority. I don't know if there should be a billion rands, even a hundred rands that gets thrown to SAA once again. SAA is not strategic. You know, business has spent, I don't know the number, so I'm not going to count, uh, uh, mention it is probably maybe around five million or whatever the cases in paying retired professionals to work with PSEC. Remember, PSEC is the committee. Remember, our president doesn't make decisions, he works through committees. He has set up a committee how many years I don't know ago, PSEC, to, 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 to come up with SOE reforms. It's led by Ian Keck. Ian Keck used to be the CEO of Sunlam. And he has said, we've got 743 SOEs. I don't know why we have 743 SOEs when all of them are dysfunctional, when all of them are depending on some form of bailout from you, but we've got 743 SOEs. And Ian Keck and the retired professionals that the PLSA is paying for are actually looking at these things to say, does it make sense for government to have 743? Which ones are strategic? Which ones are not? Which ones are duplications? Which ones need to be meshed? Which ones need to be folded into certain line ministries. And that work is being done. The president mentioned it last week and the minister mentioned it yesterday. And they're talking about the rationalization and the closing of some of the state entities. I really think that in the tight fiscal environment that we find ourselves in, I think this is going to be a sensible thing for government to do. We really don't need all 743. But it's also incumbent on the recommendations that are actually going to come from the SOE reform committee will those be implemented? Because the plan that Ian Keck and them have put together is that, Mr. President, you only need six. Six, not 743. So let's see if they are actually going to be able to, or are they actually putting these committees for the sake of it? So we're giving, again, you know, another billion rands to SA, to, and then to the South African Post Office. I really think that we're going to have to come to a place where, where, if it's an environment where the private sector plays, government should have no business play. So I don't think that they can be able to bring in the efficiencies that the private sector is actually bringing. I don't think, not yet, maybe at some point they will get to the efficiencies, but they are not there yet. So I really think that that is going to have to be maybe the strategy and the tactic until we get our issue uh, right, as it were. The disaster response, I think we all agree that uh, it has all our support. It's got the businesses' support. Uh, I think the question, again, in as far as the disaster response, is that will it actually go to those that need it the most? Will it go to those people who have lost their homes and are sitting in town halls and whatever the case is? Will it reach those intended participants or, or, or recipients? Because during COVID, money for PPE and food parcels was stolen. So you're giving another billion 
to this very same system. It, it becomes a problem when you have thieves who are masquerading as government officials. Because it raises questions whenever man is being put out there to do things that are meant to benefit ordinary South Africans. And when you get to a point where government officials and public officials see nothing wrong from stealing money for PPE and food parcels from the poor and hungry, then you should know for sure that you have lost it. So we are allocating a billion rands to those that have been affected by the disaster. Let's see if it actually gets there. It's a brilliant move, but I'm hoping that government puts in place guard rails of how does this money get to where it needs to get. Can't you give it to the NGOs? Can't you give it to those, right? I don't think it should be managed by government, but you don't see anything like that coming through. You don't see the president and the minister, they, they, they are not thinking in that line, and it's a problem. You know, why are you not giving it to... But anyway, so uh, crime and corruption, I think that is the last one. I think I've gone over my time, you bet. Crime and corruption is, is the last one. We're allocating 14 billion rands to fight crime and corruption. And I'm not going to say much on crime and corruption, but just to say that to see it's important and it's brilliant that they've spent about, what, 54 percent more than what they did last year on crime and corruption because we do need to strengthen all elements of the criminal justice system because we know the state capture project targeted those institutions and hollowed them out. That's why we're sitting in this mafia state. But if we want to see how crime and corruption affects us, we're all up. But a crime and a classical example of it in this country, you just have to look at both as common transmit because I really think that they are the perfect examples of how crime and corruption can suffocate economic development.